Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Um, at this time, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. We will be taking attendance separately, and I would like to give you a heads up that today's webinar is recorded. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We'll be getting started at noon. In the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself and what you do in the chat. So they're not seeing us yet. No, they can see us. They can see us, yeah, okay. So they see the room. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We'll be getting started in about two minutes. While we are waiting, please feel free to introduce yourself and what you do in the chat, especially since this is our first Max for Moms webinar. We'd love to know who our audience is. I see that Nicole wrote in a little bit about her credentials. Thank you so much, Nicole. We're glad you could be here today. 
We're going to give it about one more minute just to see if anyone else trickles in. I know that noon can be um, a time when people are crossing over. And while we wait, if you have any technical issues at all and are not able to utilize the chat, please feel free to email maxtraining at som.umaryland.edu and we'll be able to assist you so that you can join our webinar. All right, it is noon, so I am going to go ahead and get started. As I did mention before, this is our first Max for Moms webinar, and we are super excited that everyone could be here today. I am just going to start off with some logistical housekeeping items. Um, as you may have noticed, today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording has already started. You will also be receiving a copy of the slides as well as other Max for Moms resources following today's presentation, and you will get that to the email that you registered with. As you may have noticed, as when you entered today's meeting, you were on mute and you will not be able to come off of mute. So we do ask that you enter your questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. Today's webinar is eligible for CME and CEU credit. We will give you those details in that follow-up email, but if you have any other questions, please let us know. Um, I am just going to get started by giving us some background information about Max for Moms. So Max for Moms is our newest part of the Maryland Addiction Consultation Service, and Max for Moms is here to provide support to maternal health providers and their practices in addressing the needs of their pregnant and postpartum patients with substance use disorders and particularly with opioid use disorder. All of our services are free and we will be putting our contact information that you see on the bottom in the chat, but our services do include phone consultation for clinical questions, education and training opportunities related to substance use disorders and pregnancy and assistance with addiction and behavioral health resources and referrals. We also coming up this fall have Max for Mom Tele Echo Clinics. So these are collaborative medical education through didactic presentations and case-based learning. We'll be sure to include the information for signing up for that in the chat as well as the follow-up email. So please keep a lookout for that and we hope that you'll be able to join us. Now I am going to introduce our pre presenter today. This is Dr. Milio who's sitting next to me. And Dr. Lorraine Milio is an assistant professor in the John Hopkins Medicine Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. She serves as the obst obstetrical director and obstetrical consultant for the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy. And Dr. Milio's areas of clinical expertise include endocrine disorders of pregnancy and HIV. Dr. Milio is a fellow of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and a member of the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. She is board certified in gynecology and obstetrics, maternal fetal medicine, and addiction medicine. Dr. Milio is also a recipient of the Johns Hopkins Service Excellence Award. We're so grateful to have Dr. Milio not only as a consultant for our Max for Moms program, but also as our presenter today. So Dr. Milio, I'm now gonna turn it over to you and you can go ahead and get started. Okay. So, um, yeah, I want to start out by talking about why we, why should we, as providers of prenatal care, focus on screening and treating opioid use disorders and other substance use disorders. And for many of us, as OBQINs um, and other. Um, midwives, nurse practitioners, caring for pregnant women, often the screening and referral is just one more thing added to, uh, to our prenatal care. And I want to share, start by sharing why we really need to add this as an important part of prenatal care that we provide. So what's the scope of the, pro of the problem? Um, this first statistic is a few years old, but overall, uh, over 16% of pregnant teens and 7.4% of pregnant women between the ages of 18 and 25 have used illicit drugs. And opioid-related death has been increasing nationwide, and especially over this past year. Over Overdose deaths have increased 29.4% 
in 2020 to 93,331. Uh, 93, and even prior to 2020 and 2019, we had already well surpassed the number of deaths due to AIDS, which had peaked in uh, 1995. Unfortunately, opioid-related deaths have been a leading cause of maternal mortality across the United States over the past 12 years, including in Maryland. And many of these deaths occur postpartum. Unfortunately, many women who quit or during pregnancy resume postpartum and rates of neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, now NAUs, also known as neonatal absence syndrome, or NAS, drug withdrawal in the newborn has exponentially increased over the past 20 years. And this is a slide um, that came out uh, in about 2016. It's that every 25 minutes a baby is born suffering from opioid withdrawal. And with considerable hospital cost of hospital stay, uh, it's probably closer to every 19 or 18 minutes uh, today in Maryland that a baby is born with opioid withdrawal syndrome. Nationally, um, I want to just talk about tobacco for a minute because it's very much. Um, ties in with opioid abuse. So nationally, 22.7% of pregnant women ages 18 to 25 and 11.8% of pregnant women ages 26 to 44 continue to smoke throughout pregnancy. There are a lot of regional dis differences um, in, in that number. However, in the presence of substance use disorder, Tobacco use in pregnancy ranges from 88 to 93 percent. And there is evidence that in utero tobacco exposure negatively impacts neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. And although most pregnant smokers will decrease the number of cigarettes during pregnancy, very few quit, and many of them increase uh, postpartum. So you have the, not only the effects of tobacco on fetal development, and, but you also have it complicating uh, opioid withdrawal in the infants after birth. I'm just showing in the next uh, slide, just a schematic summary of the effects of different drug classes on offspring development. And there's a wide variety of significant structural and neurobehavioral deficits that are induced by field exposures to abuse substances. And often the drug class, timing, dose, pattern of intake, all substantially determine the long-term effects on the developing child. And as you know, polysubstance abuse is more the norm uh, than having just a single drug. And so that then has a lot of crossover effect of these drug effects. And so just focusing on opioids, um, the number one complication probably for most of these drugs is preterm delivery and the, the neonatal complications that come from preterm delivery. You can also have attenuating myelination in the infants. You can have respiratory insufficiency, reduced growth, field growth, heart defects, some deficits in cognitive and motor ability, ADHD, potentially a lower IQ and behavioral problems. And again, there's always the interaction between in utero exposure genetic predisposition and the environment in determining some of these things. So back to pregnancy. Pregnancy itself is a very unique time in which young adults engage with the healthcare system. And the important thing to 
but very importantly, guards with women with substance use disorder, is in general, pregnant women usually look beyond their own needs and problems in order to achieve the best outcome for the developing fetus. It's a new level of responsibility that they need to embrace and often are fearful of. So all care needs need to consider the mother-infant diet. And I think that's very important for us to provide prenatal care that's very inherent in how we think about the mother-infant and mother-field uh, diet, but often to with the other services that we may interact to with, substance use uh, disorder, uh, treatment providers, um, psychiatrists, internists, other people who we have to work with in caring for these patients. That diet is not uh, inherent to, uh, to their thought processes. And so we really need to, in interacting with them, protect uh, the concept of the mother-infant diet. I also want you to consider pregnancy also as a public health platform. It's a time to improve the health of women with chronic disease, including opioid use disorders. And so when I talk with my patients, and I've been doing this ever since before I worked with substance use disorder, and I did a lot of work with diabetes, but I always present two goals. One is to optimize perineal outcome but also to make care, health care and lifestyle changes that will inherit, enable the woman to maintain health in order to raise the child. So there is often increased motivation for pregnant women to address their opioid use disorder during pregnancy. And of note, there are more resources for treatment and support during pregnancy and for the year postpartum. I just want to, want to move to what the, the newer def, newest definition of addiction is that was published by the American Society of Addiction Medicine in October 2019. And that is addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and individuals' life experiences. People with addiction use disorders uh, addiction uh, use substances or engage in behavior that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Prevention effort and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. And that's something that's not well known throughout the medical community, that treatment is successful. So how we approach patients with substance use disorder. Just some general guidelines. All of these women feel guilty about the in utero exposure, regardless of their affect, and they almost always have low self-esteem. Most pregnant women will stop behaviors that they perceive as being harmful to the fetus because they want the best perinatal outcome. And so when opioid, alcohol, or other drug use continues in the pregnancy, the woman has a substance use disorder and usually cannot stop without intervention. I'm only going to briefly mention screening because that's a uh, webinar in and of itself, but there are many options out there. Uh, Espert um, has uh, proliferated through this country, which is screening, brief intervention, and referrals to treatment, doing urine toxicology, having a questionnaire, incorporating uh, questions into a new patient interview, and even just asking about tobacco use, because a yes for tobacco use should lead one to ask about other, uh, other drugs as well. Screening really should be universal, not by patient profiling. And one can consider repeating it every trimester, especially for a patient who's new to your practice. They may not be comfortable revealing uh, this information on their first encounter, but may feel more comfortable later on in the pregnancy. 
it's very important to be non-judgmental in approach and and to state the goal to the patient that you want to support her and optimize pregnancy outcome. It's also real important when doing screening that there's some documentation as to what screen was used and what the patient's response was and what referrals or uh, plans were made because of that. I'm just going to briefly talk about brief intervention because most uh, providers aren't aware that if you do a brief intervention of even five to 10 minutes, this is a billable uh, time. Uh, the provider just needs to review the harmful effects of a particular drug or alcohol use and encourage the patient to stop and often may even bring them back in two to four weeks to reiterate uh, the intervention. And this has been shown to produce lasting changes and savings, especially for those women who are more recreationally using their med these uh, drugs or alcohol um, or dabbling in them and not using them on a daily basis. Dr. Melio, we do have a question coming in from Jess Nesbitt. And yeah. Jess asks, how are you defining substance abuse? Is that substance use disorder? Yes, I'm talking, uh, I'm really uh, staying on the definition of addiction, uh, which I presented a little earlier. So yes, so I'm talking about substance use disorder um, and addiction and depending on what, what group of people you're talking to, um, I find that uh, the addiction medicine internists use addiction medicine and psychiatry tends to use more substance use disorder, but it means the same, same thing. Great, thank you. So it's also important to counsel patients with field drug exposure and looking for underlying causes and association. Between 40 and 60% of, of these women had a history of emotional, physical, and or sexual abuse. Many have a psychiatric disorder, and several have a history of severe trauma unrelated to abuse. And in order to have lasting recovery, these issues need to be identified and addressed. So many women I've seen self-medicate frequently with alcohol and drugs, I need to be referred to more constructive therapy. And unless the underlying psychiatric disorder or trauma is uh, addressed, it is difficult to have a successful treatment and even successful prenatal care. So management for opioid use disorder in pregnancy specifically uh, and I'm only going to, I'm limit my, limiting myself for opioid use disorder for the purposes of this talk. So opioid detoxification, which is not recommended, and I'll discuss that in a few minutes. Medication-assisted therapy, either with methadone or buprenorphine. Non-pharmacologic programs, and then also referral to social services to deal with the financial, housing, transportation, and food insecurities that often exist in this population. There's also different levels of care and management with opioid use disorder. The American Society of Addiction Medicine have very specific levels of care, but I'm just going to outline them in, um, in more lay terms and one of them is outpatient medication assisted treatment with, with counseling. And this may be uh, going to a methadone program, but having counseling once or twice a month, uh, receiving buprenorphine from a provider who counsels the patient at the time of giving each buprenorphine prescription. You also have intensive outpatient programming, uh, which many programs offer. And this consists of a minimum of nine to 10 hours per week of uh, group and individual sessions having to do with, um, with addiction. 
a number of uh, IOP programs, intensive outpatient programming, also have housing uh, associated with them. There's also a 28-day residential treatment programs, and they sometimes will either start someone on uh, MAT or uh, do a detoxification, uh, but provide uh, at least short-term uh, treatment. And then there are long-term treatment, residential treatment programs that are often up to one year. And several of those have mother-baby programs and have a specific program focused on pregnant women and uh, new mothers. And then you have many support groups, Narcotics Anonymous, and a lot of non-pharmacologic groups uh, that will support these women. The only problem with some of these support groups is many of them are opposed to uh, medication uh, assisted therapy. And so um, that can sometimes be a conflict for some of these patients. Opioid withdrawal can be done in either an inpatient or outpatient setting. Um, we have done methadone taper over six days or buprenorphine taper over five days. There are many different ways of doing that taper. The problem, major problem is, is that there's a very high failure rate. And so many of these women will relapse and by the time they get back into treatment, it's one or two or more months into their pregnancy. And associated with the high failure rate is then exposing the fetus to more uh, street drugs and everything that goes with that. However, it may be an entry point for patients who are hesitant to start medication-assisted therapy, and they need to find out for themselves that they need um, MAT. And we've had a number of patients who want withdrawal and then switch over to MAT. And unfortunately, there are patients who do request withdrawal because they don't have access to methadone or buprenorphine in a reasonable distance to where they live. And so access to care sometimes is an issue. Methadone maintenance. Um, methadone is pharmacologically similar to morphine, but it has a very long half-life of 24 or 36 hours. And there's several goals of methadone maintenance during pregnancy. First, and that has been shown to, um, to occur, cessation of illicit drug use, stabilizing the in utero environment, stabilizing the patient's environment. You have increased compliance with, parent, with prenatal care and enhanced pregnancy outcomes. And these outcomes have been uh, shown consistently over the last 25 years. For many years, methadone maintenance was the gold standard for treatment of opioid-dependent uh, opioid pregnant women. It still has a place in treatment, uh, especially for women who are, come to you and are stable on methadone maintenance. There are women who don't tolerate buprenorphine, and there are other women for, who have not found buprenorphine effective. I had a patient who we just started on methadone this past week who had been through several cycles of, of Suboxone and had never stopped using um, illicit opioids through that process and uh, felt and had been stable on methadone in the past. The average dose for methadone varies around the country depending often on the purity of the heroin or now the fentanyl that we, uh, that we have regionally. And unfortunately, in Maryland, we have a pretty pure form of both heroin and fentanyl. Our average dose is around 60 milligrams, but it can range from 30 to 140 milligrams. And when we start some on the methadone maintenance, we usually titrate them up to 60 milligrams over the first week and then increase them on a um, um, on a withdrawal, if they have further withdrawal symptoms. And so we do a symptomatic with uh, increase and decrease. 
Methadone is metabolized through the CYP2B6 and the CYP3A4 pathways in the liver. So you have um, drug-drug interactions with other drugs that are metabolized, metabolized through the same pathways. Specifically, the antiretroviral drugs for HIV, um, often one needs to increase one's methadone dose when they're on heart. And patients will come to me and say, my HIV medication is eating my methadone, is, the, is a frequent phrase I will hear. You also have patients who are slow metabolizers and require a lower dose, and patients who are rapid metabolizers who may need twice daily dosing. Moving on to buprenorphine, uh, from a pharmacologic point of view, it's an opioid-based, it's originally an injectable medication. It's a partial mu opioid agonist as opposed to methadone, which is a full mu opioid agonist. But it also has a weak kappa antagonist, which is a safety fit feature. So the effects are mostly at the mu receptor in a way similar to full agonists such as morphine and methadone. At higher doses, agonist effects plateau and the antagonist effects are seen. Um, so you have a ceiling uh, effect. And as a result, in, in the community, uh, people who struggle with opioid use disorders sometimes will buy street buprenorphine in order to try to self uh, De, uh, detox off opioids. But you have a high safety profile clinically. Uh, there's a lo much lower level of physical dependence than on methadone. And you have only mi much milder withdrawal symptoms upon cessation, even after prolonged administration. And because it very slowly dissociates from its receptors, it has a long duration of action and that people use varying dosing schedules. You can take it several times a day to several times a week. Buprenorphine is not given orally because it's not well absorbed and it's destroyed by the, in the liver. So it is used uh, strictly sublingually where it is well, uh, well absorbed. And its half-life is about four to five hours. And it, metabolites excreted mainly via the fe fe fecal route. So you don't have the um, liver component uh, that you have with methadone. Uh, buprenorphine was studied um, in the mother study initially, which was published in 2010, which was a double blind, double dummy, flexible dosing, randomized control study comparing methadone with uh, buprenorphine and subutex. It had 175 patients in eight international sites, and 131 neonates were followed after delivery. And what was significant is that the number of infants requiring NAS, neonatal absence syndrome treatment, was not statistically different between the two groups. However, the mean dose of methadone of morphine needed to treat these infants was significant of 1.1 milligram on buprenorphine versus 10.4 milligrams of methadone. The mean hospital stay was substantially reduced to, to, from 10, milligram, 10 days on buprenorphine versus 17.5 days on um, from uh, methadone exposed infants. And the duration of treatment was also shorter, 4.1 days on buprenorphine versus 9.9 .9 days on, on uh, methadone. So the conclusion was that buprenorphine may be advantageous for pregnant women with opioid dependency who are not already on methadone maintenance. And there are some advantages for neonates in regard to neonatal absence syndrome. However, the caveat there was the women who were in the study had opioid use disorder plus minus nicotine only. They did not, were not polysubstance abusers. 
And so when you introduce other substances, that can sometimes take away from the advantage uh, that buprenorphine may offer. But the conclusion of that study was that the use of buprenorphine is an acceptable treatment for opioid dependent women. And over the last 10 years, we have seen uh, buprenorphine, buprenorphine take over as the initial line of therapy for many opioid uh, dependent women uh, during pregnancy. Mentioned briefly about buprenorphine plus uh, naloxone, also known as suboxone, and it's probably safe in pregnancy. The small amount of naloxone present in suboxone does not appear to have a feel effect, uh, but trials are still ongoing to uh, specifically look at uh, feel and new nail effects. However, there are women who do not tolerate Subutex who do tolerate Suboxone. And I have used Suboxone in pregnancy during the, in those patients. One thing that um, is important in counseling women about medication-assisted therapy is to emphasize to them that this is not just a substitute for opioid abuse. There's often a lot of pushback from family members, even the father of the baby or the patient themselves that all you're doing is substituting one drug for another. And um, methadone and buprenorphine are much, um, much more than that. And that needs to be emphasized that this is really part of treatment, not just a substitute. Methadone is uh, currently provided through op opioid treatment programs according to very strict state regulation. Uh, methadone can be provided daily, often Monday through Saturday, uh, with take-homes for um, Sunday, and women can earn um, take-homes, and some of them can have up to a month's worth of take-homes at a time. Buprenorphine was developed to be uh, an office-based medication provided by waivered providers from any specialty. Um, and it is often given every two weeks and then may go to every four weeks uh, for a prescription. Buprenorphine can also be provided through the op opioid treatment programs, in which case it is given um, through the program with take homes, not at similar to methadone and not as a prescription. Let's well, switch now a little bit to prenatal care. What type of prenatal care do we need, do these women require? And oftentimes it's, just, it's simply usual prenatal care, especially for women where opioid use disorder is their only comorbidity. However, one may consider more frequent visits, especially after a recommendation or a change in plan. These women have a lot of often social issues that uh, make uh, engaging in substance use disorder treatment, coming to visits, or um, following up on recommendations much more difficult. And so often I'll see a patient in two weeks rather than four weeks after I've made a change in their plan or have referred them for, for, account, for treatment. Field testing per se is not indicated unless there's another obstetrical or medical reason um, occurring. And I only really do early delivery on these patients if someone is actively using, and then we will consider a 37-week delivery. Dr. Melio, we do yes. have a question from Dr. Drake, and Dr. Drake writes, for patients who want to do a methadone or buprenorphine taper, is that done in the in inpatient setting, or can it be done in outpatient? Uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we will do um, uh, inpatient uh, detoxification on the Johns Hopkins Bayview campus through the uh, addiction medicine unit. 
and that's a uh, with using buprenorphine over uh, five nights in six days. There may be uh, providers that will um, otherwise taper patients, but in general, um, most um, uh, most substance use treatment programs will not taper people during pregnancy. Um, so it's not easy to, uh, to find uh, providers who will do outpatient or inpatient tapering. There are some programs I know in other states that have admit pregnant women and have tapered them over a period of a couple months, but weeks or months, but they've had mixed outcomes with that. Thank you. Obstetrical services that we offer to these women, uh, almost all of them get a dating ultrasound because many with substance use disorder, you often have irregular menses um, and women will say, I'm not even keeping track while I'm actively using drugs. So they almost all need a dating ultrasound and then we do a feel anatomy ultrasound as per usual. And we, I will do at least a single uh, third trimester field growth ultrasound because of the uh, increased risk for field growth restriction in, these, in this population. We refer for genetic counseling and procedures as indicated for, for the general population, advanced maternal age, abnormal genetic screen, or abnormal finding on their uh, field anatomy ultrasound. We do put more of an emphasis on sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, so we do probe, probes for gonorrhea and chlamydia, not just at uh, initial prenatal visit, but if there's been any lapse in care and we'll do it at 36 weeks together with the group e strep. We also uh, do routine screening for hepatitis C, hepatitis B and HIV. And for HIV, we uh, repeat that screening at 28 uh, weeks. And there's some evidence for even repeating that at 36 weeks and um, at uh, admission for delivery for women who are actively working as sex workers um, and otherwise are maybe at increased risk. Uh, hepatitis B vaccination is offered in pregnancy and encouraged for patients who are non-immune and not carriers. If a patient is HIV positive, the patient should be referred to uh, infectious disease to initiate heart as soon as uh, possible. Both Johns Hopkins uh, Department of OBGYN as well as University of Maryland uh, Department of OBGYN has specialized clinics for uh, pregnant women with HIV. But after a positive diagnosis, um, it's important to obtain an HIV viral load, a CD4 count, an HIV genotype uh, to look at a resistance pattern in preparation for them being started on, um, on heart. If a patient is hepatitis C positive, we'll obtain a viral load and have had functional labs and, and we usually will follow them every trimester and then refer to either gastroenterology or ID postpartum for treatment. And treatment for hepatitis C has, um, is much more liberal than several years ago. And so a number of women who did not qualify for hepatitis C uh, treatment five, 10 years ago would qualify now uh, because evidence of liver damage, et cetera, is no longer required for treatment. One of the things that one needs to be aware of in caring for um, pregnant women with substance use disorder is you can have extensive medical complications resulting directly from drug abuse. You have cellulitis, abscesses in many parts of the body, uh, bacteremia, risk for endocarditis with IV drug use, and HIV AIDS. And indeed, I have um, 
one woman currently who had a history of multiple epidural abscesses uh, for which she was treated, and another patient who had multiple upper, upper arm, arm abscesses that developed uh, into DVTs and resulted in clots in both her heart and lung. If these women have pre-existing medical conditions, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, seizure disorder, or, or a severe asthmatic, they often present in poor control, especially if they have been actively using street drugs. And referring them for control of these medical conditions is, is critical. There are a number of obstetrical complications that are associated with drug use. Preterm delivery is number one across the board, but you can get intrauterine growth restriction, low birth weight, abrupt placenta, especially with um, stimulant drugs such as cocaine, uh, meconium staining, increased incidence of curial amniotis, maternal hypertension, and spontaneous abortion. When counseling patients with field drug exposure, it's real important to follow some general guidelines to reduce stigma. These women, above all, need hope and encouragement. Um, I find that the women who are most resistant to treatment are those who have given up on themselves, that they do not feel any treatment will help them. And so giving them hope is, I think, paramount. They don't need judgment and degradation. It's all of them have had some negative interactions with the healthcare system in the past. So when they appear apprehensive and sometimes even a little antagonistic, uh, it's because they, they anticipate another negative interaction. And also be aware they are very astute at detecting nonverbal cues. Uh, especially my patients who have spent time uh, living on the street, but even, even for others, they can tell from across the room whether you are having have a positive or negative um, attitude towards them. So in general, uh, medication-assisted treatment is the mainstay of opioid treatment during pregnancy, either buprenorphine or methadone. But importantly, pregnant women on MAT need education on neonatal absence syndrome and reassurance that it is a temporary condition that has no uh, to minimal lasting effects when identified and treated appropriately. And it's, this is very important that, um, that we as uh, prenatal providers have a resource, uh, whether we ourselves or someone from neonatology or pediatrics, meet with these women and discuss what to expect with NAS. And also, if available, teach them non-pharmacologic ways of dealing with neonatal absence syndrome. Women often need a lot of support if their infants, especially if they're going through severe uh, NAS or NAUs, because these women feel extremely guilty that these infants are suffering because of things they did. And, um, and I had one woman who actually overdosed and died because she couldn't deal with the severe NAS that her infant was going through. So they really need a lot of support during that time. The majority of studies do not show an association between the dose of either methadone or buprenorphine and the severity of neonatal absence syndrome. So many women who want to come down on their methadone dosing um, I'll try to redirect them to try to cut back on their smoking because probably reducing their smoking or stopping uh, smoking will have much more of an impact on the severity of their NAS versus decreasing their MAT dose, which may destabilize their recovery. 
Well, the last thing I want to talk about is um, the new laws and regulations that have come into effect um, over the last few years. So in 2016, there was a revision uh, to Title I of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, uh, known as CACTA, which was amended by the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, uh, CARA. And what, what it started as a federal regulation basically then had to be uh, passed by every state legislature in, in the U.S. by October of 2018 because failure to comply would result in the loss of federal funding of state health departments. And in Maryland, that was considered uh, to be a loss of, of close to half a million dollars a year. So uh, uh, Maryland uh, passed a, uh, their variation of CAPTA in 2018. And why the major modification is it modified the CACTA state plan requirement for states to apply uh, the policies and procedures to address the needs of infants born with and identified as being affected by all substance abuse, not just illegal substance abuse as was previously the previous requirement. So now women who are prescribed scheduled drugs or women who are stable in a medication-assisted treatment program, whether on methadone or buprenorphine, are affected by CAPTA. What this requires is a safe plan, a plan of safe care uh, for infants born and identified. And this is where things are a little are can be a little fuzzy. Uh, the, Three requirements are that the infant is affect, considered to be affected by substance abuse, either because there's a, a positive maternal or newborn tox screen, possibly a positive prenatal screen. Um, if the infant has withdrawal symptoms, and again, they're vague, are these withdrawal symptoms requiring medication or any withdrawal symptoms or having fuel, called fuel alcohol spectrum disorder. So part of the problem is that it mandates reporting but not screening. But it does require a report of plans of safe care for infants affected by all substance abuse uh, or even uh, prescribed uh, opioids. And who obtains the information? Currently, uh, this information, patient uh, hospital social workers are required to um, refer these patients um, to county child welfare caseworkers who then uh, interview the, uh, the patients and then a determination is made whether or not to uh, pick up the case. So there's a lot of uh, issues around the changes to CAPTA, but it's something that very much uh, affects this patient population. And there, I know there are women on buprenorphine who will taper off in the third trimester just so that they're um, infants are not positive at birth, but the how that affects long term is problematic because now these infants are not followed for uh, their in euro uh, exposure. So in summary, care of the pregnant women with opioid use disorder is a multidisciplinary effort to optimize perinatal outcome. These patients need prenatal care, they need evaluation and treatment for comorbidities, psychiatric, medical, they need substance abuse treatment, uh, substance use disorder treatment, and social service involvement in many cases. So 
you want best uh, to integrate approach, the best integrated approach is to have an interaction between providers of the obstetrical care and substance abuse treatment, whether it's conferences, phone, written communications, and also involving psychiatry when significant psychiatric conditions are present. In general, one cannot optimize the obstetrical and medical care unless substance abuse issues are stabilized and vice versa. There is a particular release form for opioid use uh, disorder treatment programs, uh, which uh, they can provide uh, or you can certainly get from your health, uh, from your health department. Without that release, they cannot even tell you whether your patient is undergoing treatment in their program, never mind particulars. Um, and preferably, it's good to uh, obtain that release at the time of initial prenatal visit or at time of referral uh, for treatment. All uh, all methadone uh, treatment programs are required to have a 24 hour number so that their dose can be uh, confirmed when a patient is admitted for treatment for a ride delivery or other antenatal needs. We, we do, uh, one of the services that we do provide in the Hopkins system is um, we will uh, give uh, methadone, if a patient has missed her dose in a methadone program, we will dose them on labor and delivery. Uh, we do that as a single dose um, uh, a case by case uh, situation only during pregnancy. Emergency departments will not give emergency methadone, but we feel that we don't want women missing their doses while they're during pregnancy. We find that because women often have to wait an hour for pharmacy confirmation, et cetera, in order to get their methadone, that that delay in being treated uh, makes coming to labor and delivery not a recurrent uh, event for dosing. So the goal is to have a healthy mom and baby that uh, looks no different than any other healthy mom and infant. Um, at the end of the day. So I would be happy to uh, take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for a great presentation, Dr. Melio. We are going to open the floor up for questions. It looks like we may have one in the Q&A section. So Doris Titus Glover says, thank you for the presentation. And again, keeping the focus on pregnant women with OUD. I have heard through qualitative interviews that some women view MAT, especially buprenorphine, as helping with their pain after childbirth and postpartum. What is your experience regarding MAT and the perception that it helps with pain management? Uh, well, buprenorphine actually uh, is being used more and more in chronic pain management. And if uh, a woman is on buprenorphine prior to delivery, we are continuing the buprenorphine through delivery and postpartum, even, uh, even in the presence of needing, of having a C-section. Um, in general, um, with, the, with, these, with these patients, whether it's labor or C-section, we give them early epi, epidurals with non-narcotics. And, um, and this has, uh, will help then also postpartum. We haven't used buprenorphine for acute pain. Um, and I don't know that there's a lot of work on using buprenorphine for acute postoperative or postpartum pain. But uh, certainly it, um, it is being used for chronic pain. And it's important to continue it um, after delivery. Even if a patient needs opioids, you may have to give an increased opioid dose if someone's on buprenorphine. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing it. Uh, let's see. Okay, we do have another question, and this one is from Jamie. And Jamie writes, "What is your experience with microdosing for the induction onto buprenorphine?" 
Um, microdosing, uh, we have used uh, microdosing, particularly if someone is on opioids and we're trying to transition them to buprenorphine. And that has been the um, primary use. So if we're starting buprenorphine for um, treatment of opioid use disorder, we usually wait until they're in, uh, until they have um, mo at least moderate withdrawal symptoms. And then we start um, usually two or four milligrams of buprenorphine and don't do microdosing. But for someone who is um, on opioids, uh, prescribed opioids, or like in the hospital and they're on quite a bit of opioids and we're trying to transition them uh, to buprenorphine, microdosing is very helpful in so that women can be transitioned to buprenorphine without having to go with the, through the withdrawal issues. Okay, great. Um, we do have another question from Dr. Drake, and Dr. Drake writes, can you talk about the induction protocol onto buprenorphine? How is it different from non-OB patients? Um, it's actually um, very, uh, very similar uh, in terms of uh, we don't do anything particularly different for pregnant versus non-pregnant women in terms of um, in terms of induction um, onto uh, buprenorphine, and there are a number of different uh, strategies uh, in terms of how often um, you score them and um, have them stay in the office versus go home right away, et cetera. But we don't do anything, there's nothing specific about pregnancy in terms of, uh, of induction. Um, those are all the questions that are appearing for me, but if you do have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or to put them into the Q&A section, and we will try to get those answered as we are coming up on time. I do just want to go over some housekeeping items once again, as you may be typing in those questions. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, today's, today's presentation is recorded. You will be receiving a link to that recording, either with the slides or when you receive your CME or CDU certificate, the only thing is our program takes a little bit to produce that recording. Uh, you will be receiving the slides directly following today's presentation and the evaluation to receive your CME or CDU certificate will pop up directly in WebEx. And if for any reason that does not pop up or you miss it, we will be sending you a, a link to a Qualtrics survey and we do ask that you receive that, that you fill that out to give us some feedback and then we will be sending out your certificate. Um, I'm also just going to put, as I mentioned before, this is our first mom's presentation, but we do have some other great opportunities coming up soon to receive training to prescribe buprenorphine. We are having a waiver training on September 30. 30th, and I just put the link in the chat to sign up for that. And you also, the Maryland Department of Health is offering eligible providers in select regions a one-time incentive to complete the Data 2000 waiver training, so you may be able to receive up to $1,000. I am just going to put some more information about finding out if you're eligible for that in the chat, and we do hope that you will join us. And I also mentioned our TeleOECA series, which is a great way to get advice and connect with your medical community and learn more through the didactic presentations. So I'm going to put some more information about that in the chat, as well as the sign up link. But other than that, we are coming to the end of the time and I'm not seeing any more questions. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to Dr. Melio for being our very first presenter for Max for Moms. And for all of you for joining, and we hope that you'll engage in our Max for Mom services in the future. I am just going to put our contact information and our website once again in the chat. If you have any questions at all regarding even just receiving that information or what else Max for Moms can do for you, please feel free to ask those questions now. But other than that, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.